climate change isn't just an issue for future generations anymore, or for people or animals who live far away. It's already affecting us right here in the places where we live. And the more climate changes, the bigger the impacts we'll see. If you live in the Midwest, as I used to, you understand the importance of agriculture. Agriculture in the Midwest is responsible for nearly one-fifth of the entire U.S. GDP. And if we understand agriculture, we understand the importance of climate. Where and when and how we grow our crops depends on temperature, rainfall, humidity, and many other factors that are related to and affected by climate. That's why it matters when we see temperatures climbing, when we see winter and spring precipitation increasing, and more instances of heavy precipitation throughout the year. When fields are too wet in the spring, farmers have to delay their planting by weeks, as they did in 2017. And as temperature and rainfall and humidity have increased, it's becoming harder for farmers to store the grain that they grow. Pests and pathogens also thrive in a changing climate, impacting crops as well as the forests that stretch across the northern Midwest, like in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Iconic species like the paper birch and black ash could move out of the region as ecosystems shift poleward. Cities like Chicago are already accounting for this by planting species that are native to further south, like the honey locust or redbud trees, so that when they mature, they'll be ideally suited to the climate of the future. The Chicago Botanic Garden has a Trees for 2050 study. It identifies species that would continue to thrive as climate changes. Climate change doesn't just affect the health of crops and trees, it also affects us. As it gets warmer, it's likely that the risk of poor air quality days and extreme heat waves will increase, and the pollen season is already getting longer. Climate change is also increasing flood risk in many areas throughout the Midwest. In Cedar Rapids and Des Moines, for example, what used to be considered 500-year floods just 30 years ago are now considered 100-year floods. Across the region, it's estimated it will cost nearly half a billion dollars to adapt urban stormwater systems to the much more frequent and severe storms expected over this century. But it isn't just a future issue. In 2014, Farmers Insurance led a lawsuit against the Water District of Greater Chicago after an epic rainstorm the year before caused about a billion dollars in damage across the region, a tab that was primarily picked up by the insurance companies. In the lawsuit, they said that local governments should have already acted to upgrade their stormwater facilities since they knew heavy rain events were increasing and the drainage systems were aging and becoming even more vulnerable. The irony of it is, no one could say they didn't know because I'd been part of a team that had quantified the impacts of climate change on Chicago just a few years before. The economic impacts of these changes are estimated to be in the billions of dollars. One study found that across the southern Midwest, economic losses could average about 5 to 10 percent of GDP by county, much of that driven by decreases in agricultural yields. The drops in crop yields are estimated to average over 20 to 30 percent across much of Missouri, southern Illinois, and Iowa, and 10 to 20 percent across northern Illinois, Iowa, and Ohio. Cities, rural areas, even tribal nations. All of these are vulnerable because we all depend on the natural resources the Midwest supplies. If you live in the northern Great Plains, you know that water is the lifeblood of the region. Even small changes in annual snow and rainfall totals can have big impacts downstream. As temperatures warm, more precipitation is likely to fall as rain and less as snow. Under a higher scenario where carbon emissions continue to climb throughout the century, the amount of snow across western Wyoming and western Montana, for example, could decline by 25 to 40 percent. One of the crown jewels in this region is Montana's Glacier National Park. But unfortunately, this will likely become the park formerly known as Glacier within a matter of decades. It took me by surprise when a colleague first told me a few years ago that their family was going to the park for their summer vacation. Why, I said. To see the glaciers before they were gone, he replied. At the beginning of the 20th century, the park boasted 150 glaciers. Today, only 25 remain. Two-thirds of the ice that's been lost is the direct result of warmer temperatures. And when these glaciers are gone, 
they will be gone forever in human terms. So now, many of my colleagues have done the same trip. Climate scientists making a pilgrimage to see a UNESCO World Heritage Site before it's lost. Across the entire Northern Great Plains region, warming has already led to shorter snow seasons, lower summer stream flow, and higher water temperatures. This is affecting the region's wildlife and the local economies that depend on the tourism revenue from recreational activities like skiing, snowmobiling, fishing, and hunting too. It could be impacted since many of the nation's waterfowl rely on prairie potholes. These are seasonal wetlands and very shallow lakes in the Northern Great Plains region that they use as breeding grounds. As temperatures rise, evaporation increases and the lakes dry up faster and earlier in the year, potentially before the ducklings and the goslings that hatch there in the spring have time to mature. The Great Plains from north to south is characterized by its natural patterns of drought and flood. But today, these natural swings are being amplified. Like the major flooding that occurred in 2011 that was immediately followed by severe drought in 2012. As the previous U.S. National Climate Assessment concludes, this represents new and unprecedented variability that is likely to become more common in a warmer world. The good news is that agriculture in the Northern Plains is benefiting from longer growing seasons and higher CO2 levels. Farmers in North Dakota can now grow corn and soybeans in areas that were previously too cold to plant them. While this is increasing livestock production and extending the growing season for crops, it is also increasing the ability of weeds and invasive species to compete with crops for nutrients though. And with warmer winters, some of the pests are able to survive through until spring. As it warms more and more, we expect more negative impacts with increasing risk of summer heat waves, extreme precipitation, and the continued northward migration of pests and invasive species that used to be kept at bay by cold winter temperatures. The bottom line is we care about a changing climate because it's loading the dice against us. It's taking many of our naturally occurring risks and our pre-existing vulnerabilities, and it's making them worse in ways that affect us directly here and now. I live in West Texas where the roads are long and straight so straight that if you really wanted to, you could drive down the highway just looking in the rearview mirror. Until that is, you hit a curve in the road. If you are not looking up ahead, you'll miss the curve and boom, you're off the road. What does this have to do with climate? The same principle applies. The information that we use to plan for our future is crucial. If we're relying on historical climate averages to determine future risks, We'll end up far from where we want it to be, unprepared for intense rainfall, record heat waves, or rising seas up ahead. No matter where we live, we're on the curve today. And what can we do about it? We need to prepare, to build resilience to the risks that we can't avoid, and as I discuss in many other Global Weirding episodes, to reduce our emissions of heat trapping gases to avoid the risks that we can. The U.S. National Climate Assessment is one important resource that helps us look ahead down that road. Please check out nca2018.globalchange.gov for more valuable information on how climate is changing in the places where you live and what we can do to prepare. Thanks for watching Global Weirding. This episode was brought to you in part by Citizens Climate Lobby. If you have any questions about climate versus weather, let us know during one of our Facebook Live Q&As. And please be sure to check out globalweirdingseries.com for more episodes. See you next time.